it's great to be with you tonight. And it's a pleasure to discuss with you the role of Franciscan tradition in the Salesian reform of militant Catholicism. Before beginning, just a few remarks. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Salesian refers to Francis de Sales, who was an exceptionally gifted preacher, writer, and pastoral leader who lived in the 16th and 17th centuries during the French Wars of Religion. And at times during my presentation, I will go into some of the details of his life and French Catholicism. And there'll be times where I won't mention much about Franciscans, but um, rest assured I'll get back to the Franciscans uh, soon enough. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to mention that while uh, Francis de Sales uh, deeply admired Francis of Assisi, and I do too, uh, most of my Franciscan content will deal with uh, Bonaventure and Scotus. Around 1590, at the age of 23, Francis de Sales described in personal notes a contemplative practice he intended to observe while in law school. Calling this practice a prayer of rest, Francis explains how it would enable him to surrender to Christ's embrace like the beloved disciple John, and thus immerse himself in the goodness and love of God, who, like a fountain, provides us with the water of life. I begin with this moment and this prayer in the life of Francis de Sales because they help us anticipate themes in this talk. First, Francis's language of love, goodness, and life-giving water closely resembles that of Bonaventure and Franciscan tradition more broadly. And while we don't know if Francis drew on Franciscan resources in this instance, he would do so frequently over the next 32 years, inspired not only by Bonaventure, but Dun Scotus as well. Secondly, I begin with Francis's prayer of rest description from 1590, because the trust in divine love he demonstrates in this practice had not come easy to him. In the 1580s, Francis de Sales had become overwhelmed by feelings of guilt, sin, as well as divine punishment. Indeed, as we shall see, preoccupations with sin and damnation often overshadowed faith in God's goodness and love among Catholics during the French Wars of Religion. Since the 1970s, a compelling body of scholarship has demonstrated that during the French Wars of Religion, both French Catholics and French Protestants under, often understood and practiced their Christian faith in terms of combat. A good Christian waged war on heresy, battled idolatry, and combated sin. On many occasions during the French Wars of Religion, this meant violent aggression against people and sacred objects, which was considered a fulfillment of God's will. For God, many believed, had little tolerance for incorrect belief, worship, or behavior. Turning to French Catholicism, we find a Catholic militancy consisting of violence against Protestants illustrated most obviously, but not exclusively, by certain massacres that occurred. We also find violence directed by Catholics against other Catholics, such as the assassinations of the kings Henry III and Henry IV. Again, it's important to note that there is considerable evidence for theological or religious support for these events. 
And we know this through various media, sermons, pamphlets, and uh, personal writings. Scholars have also demonstrated that Catholic militancy expressed itself in aggressive personal piety, which I call a severe Augustinianism. Not infrequently in parishes, monasteries, confraternities, and households, we encounter Catholics for whom original sin is the defining moment in salvation history and an individual sense of profound sinfulness uh, was very strong. Some Catholics responded by engaging in punitive and aggressive asceticism. Bringing Francis de Sales back into the discussion, there is compelling evidence that he absorbed this severe Augustinianism in his youth. In personal documents, he described himself as deeply sinful as strongly inclined to evil. He feared that God predestined him to hell and he subjected himself to harsh corporal penances, including flagellation. In one year, he languished in fear and despair for about six weeks, growing seriously ill. Francis de Sales did emerge from this spiritual crisis and in its wake, he underwent an extraordinary spiritual and theological transformation. God's goodness, love, mercy, and sustenance began to strike him as the most powerful guiding realities in existence and gradually occupied the center of his religious imagination. Certain biblical passages played a pivotal role in this. The account of Jesus and the beloved disciple mentioned earlier, but also the Song of Songs, the gentle, humble Jesus of Matthew eleven twenty nine, and the account of Mary and Elizabeth in the visitation. These all assured Francis of God's intimate, loving, merciful, and sustaining presence. Across several years, Francis developed a deep trust in God's superabundant love for humanity and all creation. By the 1610s, divine love informed nearly all aspects of his spirituality and thought. And this would culminate in his treatise on the love of God published in 1616, key teachings of which we will explore explore in this presentation. Uh, for me, one of the most striking uh, of his lines is, love is the universal means of salvation. As his theology flourished, in my view, Francis simultaneously developed what I call a reform of militant Catholic zeal. The more loved the more that love defined his religious imagination, the more he distanced himself from critiqued and dismantled religious militancy. Increasingly, Francis called Catholics to imitate the gentle, humble Jesus of Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. In my view, this Salesian reform of zeal constitutes a remarkable and prophetic refashioning of Catholic imagination and relationality in church history. In collective Catholic memory, however, this reform of zeal has often been underappreciated or overlooked. I think there are several reasons for this. I think one is that we've overlooked just how much Francis uh, changed over time. And secondly, um, in my view, his, his spirituality has often been conflated with the Devo movement, a very influ influential Catholic movement in the late 1500s and early 1600s. In what follows, I will argue that in his mature theology, 
which draws on Bonaventure and Scotus. Francis put divine love and the mystery of the incarnation at the center of the Catholic imagination. And in doing so, he proceeded to break definitively from the Devo movement and in ways dismantled their severe Augustinianism. In my view, I see the Devo continuing the militant Catholicism of the Catholic League. Uh, the Catholic League was a political military faction which had been defeated in the 1590s. While the Devo movement did not engage in physical warfare as the League had, it did engage in violent anti-Protestant rhetoric, demonized Catholics who tolerated Protestants. It preached that satanic possession was common and adopted an Augustinian theological orientation Some of the uh, key figures that I have studied, and um, some of whom you may recognize, are on the screen. It's important for me to uh, mention, I think, that uh, Francis de Sales um, knew many of these figures, and um, he was familiar with their writings. Um, I also like to point out that he um, that some of these folks are uh, Capuchin Franciscans. Uh, so in my research, I've seen a wide variety of forms of Franciscan spirituality during the French Wars of Religion. Uh, maybe that's something we can pick up in uh, question and answer. At the center of the Devo spirituality, we find human sin and God's judgment of sin. This prevails in their personal writings, devotional works, sermons, and more. The most crucial events in salvation history are Adam's fall and Christ's cross. God is often depicted as a victim of human uh, mistreatment, human sin. Uh, God is often uh, portrayed as judge and punisher as well. In DeVoe writing, sin made a victim of Jesus and it continues to do so in the present moment. So one can find in their writings the idea that, that humanity continues to crucify Jesus. In the various writings of the DeVoe, the fall had a absolutely uh, devastating impact. The sin of Adam and Eve wounded and offended God so seriously uh, that thereafter creator and creation were deeply alienated. And according to some writers, uh, they were opposed to each other. Sin and evil prevailed in the uh, created order, something I refer to sometimes as a very uh, thin incarnationality. Um, I also think of, when I read their work, sometimes I think of they've negated the notion or spirit of God with us or Emmanuel. It's as if they have come to believe God is not with us, uh, which is very striking for a Catholic theology. Uh, one also detects uh, a certain moral panic, a sense that uh, the power, power of evil is uh, growing continually. And there's certain dualistic tendencies among the Devo, uh, which comes close to suggesting that the power of evil is almost of equal power, um, of equal power with divinity. So one gets the sense sometimes that uh, God, God Himself, and His authority are under threat. Although this may be kind of depressing, I think we, you know, I just have to say for what it is, uh, one often finds uh, among the Devo uh, the notion that humans are uh, perverse, filthy, uh, vile. Um, I remember when I first read their works, I thought of Calvin or Luther. And uh, in many ways, they ended up, it seems, embracing a similar 
severe Augustinianism. Uh, the Devo also uh, state without hesitation that we are the enemies of God and that we deserve the greatest of punishments. In striking deviation from the gospels, the Devo often taught that God uh, does not tolerate impurity, um, that God is without filth, so God is pristine, immaculate, but humans are filthy. Um, one uh, sister, Beauvillier, uh, she wrote that Jesus finds God, uh, humans' ideas and thoughts odious. Um, a Franciscan, uh, Bennett of Canfield, wrote that human will and divine will cannot intermingle because they're fundamentally opposed. One can also find um, a notion of annihilation common in their writings. So the notion that uh, human beings must annihilate themselves in order to become worthy. One can also find um, in the writing of in the writings of the Devo depictions of God as violent. Uh, since God does not tolerate impurity, he quote violently plucks out imperfections. Um, one can find the idea that the incarnation occurred so that Jesus could uh, battle and destroy impurity. Uh, one also finds the ideas, uh, and this is one of the more radical ideas, I think, and uh, this would be a figure who's perhaps not in the Devo movement, but he was close with folks in the movement. Uh, there was a certain um, priest and scholar who preached that God used um, various human groups in history to um, kill those who are ungodly or impure. Uh, this priest also taught that ca true Catholics should exterminate uh, French Protestants. At last, we return to Francis de Sales. Um, it is true that Francis knew uh, the leading figures in this movement. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that he did respect aspects of some of their fervor. Um, I think he did respect aspects of their some of their ministries. I think he I think he felt like he understood them. Um, I think he saw in them what he himself had believed in his youth. Um, but I believe he changed uh, radically over the course of his life. Before turning to Bonaventure, I want to um, just offer uh, some uh, general moments in history where Francis had exposure to the Francis, the Franciscan tradition. It appears that Francis, excuse me, Francis de Sales was named after Francis of Assisi. There's evidence that uh, the parents had a painting of Francis of Assisi in their home. We also know that uh, in Padua, when Francis was in law school, he met a Franciscan, Filippo Gesualdi, uh, who I think um, brought Francis's attention to Bonaventure and SCOTUS. And we also have evidence that Francis continued to read the works of early Franciscans um, throughout his life. I want to consider how I think uh, Francis de Sales drew on Bonaventure. The earliest mention of Bonaventure is around 1590, when Francis was about 23 years old, about the time when he wrote his Prayer of Rest. Um, I think it's in his mature theology that Francis de Sales begins to, to speak Bonaventurin, if, if one could use such a phrase. Um, consider France, Francis's doctrine of God, which closely resembles that of Bonaventure. So Francis de Sales writes, uh, God is the good, sovereign good, supreme good, infinite good. Uh, Francis de Sales speaks of the good and love as largely interchangeable. So God is love. God's heart is full of love. The Trinity consists of bonds of love. Uh, all the works of Jesus and the Gospels are done in love. Uh, additionally, Francis de Sales 
begins to speak of God as self-diffusive, self-communicating, and superabundant. So much of this strikes me as uh, Bonaventure's uh, language, although one could certainly say, well, that could come from pseudo Dionysius or Richard of St. Victor or others. So there's certainly a conversation uh, that could be had about this. In the treatise, Francis de Sales also uses water and fountain imagery to speak of the divine, much as Bonaventure did. Uh, his bounty is, is fountain of, of abundant waters. God is the Father. God the Father has fountain and stream. God has fountain of eternal life. Uh, God is stream of living water. Similar language is found in Book 1, Chapter 2 of Bonaventure's commentary on Lombard sentences. Turning to the Trinity, Francis de Sales has moving poetic passages in his treatise that parallel those in Chapter 6 of Bonaventure's Itinerarium. Francis de Sales describes um, God the Father diffuses his love, generates the Son, gives all of himself to the Son. The Son rejoices in the divinity shared with the Father. The Father rejoices. Uh, they breathe They breathe a loving breath, generating the Spirit. Uh, Francis de Sales says, uh, what joy there is in this eternal birth. So um, this... Uh, this uh, affective, uh, joyful, and um, celebratory uh, spirit about the Trinity, um, these themes of generosity, fecundity, relationality, um, these all strike me as sharing with Bonaventure. When Francis speaks of the uh, created order, um, he sees uh, the sacred as pervasive. Uh, he sees a divine presence um, throughout the universe. Francis writes that divine love overflowed beyond the Trinity, generates countless creatures. And Francis de Sales writes that God left footprints on all created things. He asserts that divinity is all in all in the world and all in every part. One finds a similar assertions in Bonaventure, especially the language of footprint, divine footprint. Bonaventure holds that God exists in all things. God is all in all, and the creator shines in created objects. When Francis uh, speaks of creation, he emphasizes diversity, proportion, beauty. He argues that uh, God adorned creation with beauty so that we turn to the creator. He mentions Francis of Assisi, uh, embracing animals. Uh, all of this here again resembles Bonaventure in the uh, Breviloquium and the Itinerarium where one finds very uh, similar expressions and ideas. Finally, uh, regarding Bonaventure, uh, one find well, excuse me, regarding Francis de Sales, uh, one finds a certain celebration or exaltation of humanity that comes through the incarnation. Francis writes, uh, with the incarnation, humans attain an incomprehensible unity with God. Uh, the incarnation elevated our dignity. The incarnation was an excess of loving goodness. Um, and Francis also uses Proverbs 831 to express the idea that God delights to be with us. In Bonaventure, one finds uh, similar ideas. Human nature is ineffably united to God through the incarnation. Humanity is wonderfully exalted by the incarnate Christ. The incarnation is an ex excess of God's self-giving. And one also finds Proverbs 
831. In my view, uh, one can find um, a similar outlook on God. God is love. God is overflowing, uh, generous, generative. Uh, God delights in us. And lastly, I'll mention that um, on uh, one occasion, uh, Francis, speaking of uh, redemption, um, he well, he wrote in 1619 that redemption is copious and superabundant. And um, many years earlier, he wrote, uh, my fervent ser uh, seraphic father, St. Bonaventure, tells us redemption of our Lord is overabundant and more than sufficient. Uh, one thing I tried to uncover in my research was uh, which works uh, Francis, of, excuse me, Francis de Sales, uh, uh, cited the most, and these are the main works uh, that popped up, and uh, you see Bonaventure the most. No SCOTUS, uh, which, uh, which brings us to uh, what about SCOTUS? So there's no mention of SCOTUS's works in the writings of Francis de Sales, uh, only three to four mentions of SCOTUS himself. And um, it's my impression that uh, Francis de Sales learned SCOTUS through various scholars who read SCOTUS and offered commentaries on his works. In any event, it appears that Francis came to know SCOTUS's theology quite well. This is evident in specific elements in Salesian theology, especially concerning the nature of God's will, the centrality of the incarnation and Christ in God's will, and in the Salesian affirmation of a universal salvific will. And uh, briefly, I just want to recognize some folks in the past who have, I think, spoken this same series who, uh, who helped me explore these topics. So uh, Bernard McGinn, uh, Wendy Wright, Joe Corpenning, and um, the SCOTUS scholar, Mary Beth Ingham. So uh, there's a lot of good folks out there doing wonderful work, and um, they've helped me. Francis de Sales asserts in a variety of ways that God's will is free, eternal, love-driven, and sovereign. Here, Francis de Sales is speaking the language of SCOTUS, uh, given that SCOTUS is famous for developing these eyes, developing these ideas so persuasively. Uh, Francis writes that uh, what God does, uh, what God wills is by choice, by de desire, by delight. Uh, God's will operates independently of temporal realities. God's will is rooted in love, and God's will is the ultimate, supreme, and final authority. Francis de Sales spends a lot of time, uh, and I think he does this in a pastoral, and uh, a pastoral spirit. He tells people over and over in uh, personal writings and in his treatise that uh, sin is just no match uh, for divine sovereignty. Uh, no human evil can upend God's providence. Francis stresses time and time again that God turns or bends all things uh, to the welfare of creation. And Francis liked to use the story of Joseph in Genesis uh, to illustrate this. Uh, I find it very striking um, how much Francis de Sales seemed to want to get across that God is in charge and God is aware of all that is happening. Uh, God heals, God transforms all transgressions and um, where sin abounds, uh, grace superabounds. Francis de Sales uh, discusses the ordered nature of God's will, uh, arguing, arguing that what is first in the order of intention is last in the order of execution. 
Uh, this is a, a key teaching for SCOTUS. Francis de Sales discusses the example of a, a winemaker who wants uh, grapes. Uh, the grapes and wine are the goal, but the planting of the vines uh, come first. Uh, this closely resembles what SCOTUS says about the vision and the work of, of an artist. Francis proceeds to uh, apply this model to God. He argues that from all eternity, God des desired to communicate or share himself and determined that nothing would be so excellent as creating odd extra or outside of himself and yet uniting with this creation. Francis continues along Scotus, uh, the lines of Scotus. Uh, God desired the sun to assume, created nature first. God wanted uh, the sun to be the centerpiece of this extra Trinitarian creation. Um, and then God anticipated that creation would exist uh, through and for Christ. Uh, so although Jesus uh, will be born after the universe is created, the incarnate word is first in God's intention. Uh, one can find a similar line of thinking in the Ordinatio of Scotus, um, something which uh, scholars often refer to as the absolute predestination of Christ. Francis de Sales continues um, uh, on to discuss the execution of God's will. He says in one single act, God executes his will for the incarnation and creation. The, cre the created order emerges through and for the incarnate son. The incarnation, uh, Francis insists, is the greatest of all Christian mysteries, and he at times... Uh, is ecstatic in his writings, a lot of exclamation points. And um, I think that's where he he's probably gets more excited than SCOTUS does. That's my, my general impression. Um, Francis wrote on one occasion that the mystery of the incarnation and its results su surpass all the works of God. And uh, similarly, SCOTUS asserts the incarnation is the highest work of God. Francis de Sales uh, uses uh, Colossians 1, 15 to 18, uh, much as Scotus does. The incarnate Christ is the first object of God's creative love. Christ is the firstborn of God's creation. The Son, the eternal word, has primacy. It's the incarnate Son. Uh, was generated before time, and all the created all the created order exists through him and for him. Francis de Sales also makes the argument that the incarnation would have occurred if even if Adam had not sinned. He writes, "God foreordained this world for his incarnate Son." prior to the sin of our parents and prior to Lucifer, one might imagine that he had read Scotus. Uh, Scotus writes, from eternity, God wanted human nature to be glorified in the word. God did not become incarnate on account of sin. Francis de Sales insists, much as Scotus did, that the incarnation flows from divine love. He writes that God wished to honor the Son with the incarnation. Uh, he wrote that in his superabundant love, God wished for creation to participate in divine goodness. Uh, one finds similar ideas in the Ordinatio. Uh, Salesian theology also uh, strongly stresses um, a belief in the universal salvific will. Uh, God desires the redemption of all humanity. God wishes to save all mankind. Uh, the Lord has repaired all of us. 
Francis uses uh, 1 Timothy 2.4, and uh, Francis de Sales does explicitly mention SCOTUS as uh, holding this position. And uh, for me, this is very striking that uh, Francis de Sales um, put explicitly in writing that he was breaking with uh, Augustinian and Thomistic schools of thought, which had asserted that God predestined some people to hell in order to demonstrate divine justice. Scotus um, asserts similar ideas in his works. I'll move um, quickly to the next slide, just in the interest of time. In these uh, final eight or 10 slides, um, I'd like to argue that um, in his mature theology, I see uh, a prophetic incarnational vision. I see Francis de Sales um, looking at the De Vaux movement and much of French Catholicism and concluding um, that it amounted to an unbalanced, unbiblical, often dualistic, um, Emmanuel deficient, I made that up, we'll see if I stick with that, severe Augustinian Catholicism. In my view, uh, I believe that he saw their theology um, reflecting what he had himself had believed, uh, sin-centered, uh, God distant from us, creator, creation, alienation, evil, dominating creation, humanity as vile, God as intolerant and violent. I'd like to add that uh, one can find in the writings of the Devo, um, Christian love often uh, being reduced to um, purity. Uh, purity is the goal of Christian love. So if you love God, you cleanse yourself of filth. Uh, one can find the idea that uh, distrust is a proper Christian attitude. You should distrust, distrust yourself, others, nature, and society. Uh, one can also find the idea that if, if you love God, then you must combat impurity. Um, and such combat is uh, a virtuous embodiment of Christian love. In contrast, Francis de Sales holds that unity, not purity, is the goal of Christian love. And he uh, articulates this in a variety of, of moving ways and creative ways. Acts 2, uh, early Christians were of one heart and soul. Uh, unity, there is unity among the diversity of creation. Jesus asked at the Last Supper preached, uh, may all be one. Uh, I think Francis drew on um, pseudo Dionysius as well as Bonaventure in the idea that the good or love tends toward union, uh, which I think is a, a, a Neoplatonic um, truism. Um, and strikingly, in my opinion, Francis de Sales argued that Jesus stressed unity and union with others even more than with God. Francis de Sales maintains that trust in God's will is the proper attitude of Christian love. Here again, he's just, um, I find him incredible, incredibly encouraging, uh, prophetic. These are not from the treatise so much, but, but from... Um, pastoral letters, letters of spiritual direction. He writes, um, entrust yourself fully to his infinite goodness and mercy. He told another person who was just a very afraid, very afraid of God's punishment, uh, very fear, afraid of death. He told this person, uh, leave your soul and your body in the arms of divine providence, uh, which to me, brings the mind of Jesus and the, and the beloved disciple. 
Francis also writes on many occasions that um, no matter how much sin and evil one encounters, uh, don't give in to despair because God, all God's works ultimately um, are ordained for the salvation of creation and humanity. Francis Sales also uh, holds that embrace, uh, not combat, is the, uh, generally speaking, the proper embodiment of Christian love. And he relied often on the Song of Songs. He, he actually uh, wrote on a number of occasions that um, in the Song of Songs where it says, um, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, Francis argues that that uh, refers to the incarnation. Probably not unique to Francis de Sales, but he did like to repeat that. Uh, Francis argues that embrace is, is the proper embodiment of Christian love. Look at Mary and Elizabeth. Uh, look how they minister to each other. Look at their bond. Look at their mutual support. Uh, look at their celebrating uh, their miraculous pregnancies. Uh, look at how they um formed community at a time that was probably also stressful for them so embrace embrace is the way of christian love um not combat uh francis de sales uh, often appeals to uh matthew eleven twenty nine, um the gentle jesus uh that is depicted there uh the notion that that christ offers rest uh for us and um, and to finish uh, where I began, uh, Francis frequently used uh, Jesus and the beloved disciple to argue that embrace is the way of Christ, embrace is the way of Christian love. And so we are called to, to use these as our models. And um, he saw that uh, lacking in much of the Catholicism of his day. I'll stop there. Thank you.